Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Dave. I'm a parent of a daughter in college, and we live in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. Good morning, friends, and I come to you with great enthusiasm and alacrity from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, A lot has happened since I met with you guys a few days ago, and our regular listeners probably know this about me, but uh, I really love to travel. When I was in admissions, my favorite season of the four admission seasons was the travel season. And during the pandemic, the hardest part about the pandemic for me was I lost all my college fly-ins and conferences, which were all canceled and put online. So this week I get both. So I was part of a college counselor fly-in program, only 11 of us. It was nice and quaint to Cleveland, Ohio, and then on to the College of Worcester, which was fantastic. And I'm not going to share it uh, more details about it today, but I will share more uh, coming up within the next 30 days with you. So I was there for the 20th and the 21st and then drove right to Jacksonville on the 22nd. It was awesome. Linda and, and Susan both flew in and got in within two minutes of each other. So I picked them up at the airport. We had a fantastic meal and Lisa's in route right now. Got another team meal planned. Uh, Monday morning breakfast tomorrow, but we're here for the SACAT conference, which is my favorite conference every year, a place for professional development for both admission officers and for college counselors. So we're here in Jacksonville. I'm, I'm here actually from the 22nd all the way through the 26th. The conference ends on the, the 25th, but there's some college tours that I'll be staying around to, to participate on in the area. And so once again, we'll share with you details of our travels anytime we think it will be of interest to you. Before we dive in today, I have a few requests from our audience. Uh, The first one goes back to some background. Let me give you some background for the first request. We did our 2122 survey. And one thing that stunned me in that survey was more than 33% and might have even been 40% had never been to yourcollegeboundkid.com. Never, not even once. I was asking questions in that survey and people just said, no, and they and they and they'd never been there. And I just want to let you know, there are a lot of benefits about our website. Let me share a few. As you know, we run college spotlights over two episodes and interviews as many as five episodes, certainly three and four parters are common. And the entire interview without breaks in you know, without any discontinuity. You can listen to the whole t- the whole thing. And we have 138 interviews up there. We have 126 spotlights. And our spotlights are divided by region of the country. So if you're interested in schools on the West Coast, you know, we have more than 20 spotlights up there. You can search by the Midwest, Southwest, Southeast, Mid-Atlantic, Mountain West, Northeast. They're all there without having to do part one, part two, okay? And if, if, you, if you're someone who doesn't want any interruptions, just give me this information. It's all there. Also, photos of our interview interviewees. Sometimes it's nice to see what these people actually look like we're talking to. And our blog is there. And the blog has, you know, I think it's relatively new, but I think we have 30 articles up now, close to that. Uh, you can also search by topic. So a lot of times I'll get questions. You know, someone will say something like, uh, when is that, what was that episode where you talked about all this college mail that my kid is getting? And you can just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com. There's a search bar, put in the word mail and see what pops up. Our transcripts are there, like I said. 
there's a lot of information. You can also see uh, things are categorized. So, for example, you can go to all the interviews. They can go on the on the right side of the page, midway down, and you want to say, well, what interviews have they done on the essay? You can click essay. And you can see all the interviews we've done on the essay. So if you haven't been to yourcollegeboundkid.com, I just really encourage you to check it out. Uh, I think you're going to find it to be incredibly helpful. And special shout out to Linda. She's been working really hard on not only our blog, but also uh, we're about to have a relaunch. And we're not quite ready yet. I can't tell you when. But you're going to like the facelift the website's going to get. Um, I'll probably have Linda come on and talk to you more about the changes once those are up. But check out your cosmonkid.com. The second thing I want to request is I don't mention this very often, but if you've never done a review for your cosmonkid.com, I'd ask that you would consider giving us a review. I'll just be blunt a five star review. <laughs> and I don't like to tell people what to give us as a rating. Certainly, if you don't think we deserve a five star, then you don't need to do that. I've never ask you to do anything against your integrity. Otherwise, reviews are meaningless. But in the world of reviews, there's massive review inflation, just like great inflation. I've never seen a podcast, and there may be one out there, but I've never seen one that has a rating of under four, the rate out of five. Like I've never seen a 3.3 .3 or 3.7 or 3.8. So, uh, to, to quote Bamboni Jones from Atlanta, who's on ESPN, has his own podcast. If you give me a rating other than five, I'm inclined to believe you're a hater. Because four is a failure in the, in the podcast review world. But we have 192 without really asking for them. I'd really hope we could be at 200 by next week. If eight of you would go over and give us a review, I'd be most grateful. And just share your, the most important thing, honestly, is, is the description as other people find podcasts based on the reviews that they receive. So just, just give an accurate uh, reflection of what you honestly think about our podcast so that others can discern, is this a podcast worth them listening to? And I just want to thank everybody, everyone who has ever shared our podcast with anyone, Facebook. A lot of people find us on Facebook groups like Grown and Flown and Paying for College 101. We got a lot of feedback. So whoever's sharing us in those groups, thank you, thank you, thank you. Social media of any sort, any source, um, just verbally talking with counselors, friends, over coffee, jogging, whatever you do. Um, I just want to thank you. You know, I when podcasts first started, and most podcasters are this way, you're like addicted to your stats. I literally remember checking our stats five and six times a day. I know, I'm that obsessive type, I, I confess. Then after a while, you know, you kind of forget about your stats. And now sometimes, like, I think three months have gone by and I just forgot about our stats. Um, and then I'll remember, oh, our stats, let's go check our stats. So I went over and checked our stats for March and we smashed a record. It was an all-time record for us. We had over 41,000 um, downloads. Um, and I'm just grateful to you for that. I know that's not the kind of numbers you get on like a New York Times, the daily or NPR, but for a niche topic like this, it is a lot like the national average is 140, uh, downloads a month for podcasts. So I'm really thankful to smash that 41,000 mark. And I know it's because of word of mouth. And so uh, just a collective thank you to everybody who's ever told anybody um, about our podcast. Uh, as far as our topic for today, um, of course, we'll end with the final part of my interview with Julie Shields Rutna. And I said Julie, not Julia, for once. And Jonathan Hughes, our friends from MIFA.org, as we'll do part three of three on paying for college. Uh, I'll get to that in this, you know, later on. But I'm continuing my series before we get to that on reflections on the 2023 admissions year, now that all the decisions are in. And I'll be really transparent with you, with you guys. You know, we went to the Monday podcast in June and the Monday numbers are never quite as high as the Thursday numbers. And I'm assuming that's because some people have been listening to us for a long time and they're in the habit of listening on Thursdays, but maybe not Monday. I don't know if we've ever had a week where we had more listeners on the Monday podcast than the Thursday podcast, but something hit a spark last week with the 
75 hardest colleges to get into that I shared, or at least from, from our research. And um, so I try to listen, you know, when you hit a chord, you try to, I want to scratch where people are itching. And so I've decided to, to follow up on that topic again this week. I'm not going to be doing this every week, but I figured one more week on this topic. Uh, if it works last week, maybe it'll work again. So um, originally my goal was to share the 100 most selective, not all 100 again, just pick up and go from 76 to 100 and make it an even 100. Uh, but that ended to up being more of a Herculean task than I expected. I was looking at the data and there were just so many schools that were grouped together. And to me, it's more important than I be accurate than clever or niche. So what I'm going to share with you are the 25 next hardest private schools to get into and the 10 hardest public schools. So it's 35, 25, and 10. And hopefully this will also be helpful for you. Now, the main purpose for this is not so people can fixate on just pound your chest and say, I'm going to one of the 100 most selective schools in the country. Um, that's not the purpose. The purpose is for people who are attempting to build lists themselves to understand where it gets harder to get into so that you can have balance in your list. So that's the purpose. So I call this group the 4% Club just because, you know, there are approximately 2,500 four-year accredited schools in the country you know, degree granting, nonprofit, federally funded schools. And so 4% of, of 2,500 is, you know, the, the, hundred, the top 100. Um, and when I say our research, you know, I went back and listened to last week and, you know, I'll share one other thing. This is just the confession hour, all kinds of things I'm sharing today. Um, I go to incredible lengths to not really talk about uh, private college counseling that I do with Lisa and Linda and Kevin helps us out with that as well for international students. Um, on this podcast, I, I don't think I've ever even mentioned the name of our company even once. I've just tried to just really keep those things really separate. But as I was listening um, last week, I, I thought it might be confusing. Like, who is he talking about when he talks about the research they've done? So like I said, it just feels a little icky to me to be talking talking about that work. I'm trying to keep them separate. One of the best compliments I ever got was from a listener in 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 Colorado who said, what I love about your podcast here, is you're the one podcast that's not trying to sell me. I'm trying to sign up for your services. And so just try to keep them separate. But like I said, I felt like I was almost contorting myself in a pretzel to avoid who I was referring to when I said this research comes from. And I just want to say it again, this is our research from private clients that we work with and have worked with over the last three years. Uh, it is based on thousands of decisions. You said, are you, you guys work with thousands of clients? No, not thousands of clients, but if you have one student and they apply to 15 schools, you multiply it out and you end up with thousands of decisions. Um, in some cases, some schools in the research, we might have seen 50 decisions over the last few years. In other cases, not as much. Um, in some cases, I, I am incorporating a little bit of my networking into this assessment, too. Uh, Julia and I, we always do a recap every year and compare notes, <clears throat> what she's hearing out there, what I'm hearing out there, because she also sees thousands of decisions. So it's a little bit of incorporation of that, but it's mostly based on our personal results. But sometimes if maybe the numbers are no, I haven't seen as many decisions you know, from one school, I might incorporate a, a little bit of of what I learned from my annual conversations with Julia. Um, and the one thing I do want to say about the 4% club is there's some cases where some colleges were really on the cusp of being included last week. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, I'll, I'll give you one example. University of Miami, that school's become a lot more selective, a lot more selective. It's hard to believe how selective it's really becoming compared to how it used to be. So there's some schools that were kind of on that cusp. Um, and then there's a lot more of that. There is kind of a break between the 3% and the 4% club from my experience. And when I say a break, what do I mean? A clear differentiation in selectivity. 
Um, a lot of schools in the 4% club, which is what I'll be sharing with today, let's just use it from a grade standpoint. Um, it's okay if a student has a few Bs past ninth grade or an explainable C. That's not necessarily the, the kiss of death, but that's pretty tough in that first group. Now, I hesitate to put it in grades terms. And of course, I'm talking about in academic subjects, math, English, science, social studies, foreign language. I hate to put it in grades terms for a few reasons. One, sometimes when I talk to students this way, they'll be like, are grades the only thing that matters? What about extracurriculars? So no, grades are not the only thing that matters. And why I don't like to put it in grade context is for several things. One, some schools have massive grade inflation. And colleges that are doing holistic admissions, having a couple Bs or a C, that could be a problem. Also, schools look at how your curriculum aligns with your intended field of study. So having the wrong grades in courses that you're interested in could be certainly could be really, really, really problematic. And so so that's a factor. Another thing is your grade trends. They certainly matter. And of course, all the other important components of the of the application. Um, and, and then, of course, your rigor, certainly huge, your amount of rigor, not just a grade, but your rigor. So there, there are lots of other things that matter beyond that, but it's just a kind of a simple way of differentiating in a real shorthand way is to, to say grades. I do notice that a lot of students for this group, they can have, like I said, maybe a few Bs and occasional explainable C. And it's not necessarily the kiss of death for a lot of schools um, we're going to share with you today, whereas, you know, for the other bucket, it, it would be brutal. So before we dive in uh, with that group, I also had some requests for, well, what are the absolute hardest to school, schools to get into? So I said, you know what, let me share that as well. I think our research is, is pretty clear on that. So the five absolute killer hardest schools to get into, no question in my mind, I don't think this is disputable, although we're going to say more in a second about special programs that can always be exceptions. I'm not talking about special programs, but that would be Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, MIT. Those five are the hardest to get into. I just mentioned MIT as being one of the five hardest schools to get into, but let me say a word about MIT. So earlier this week, I had a session with a client I'm working with in Maryland uh, a regular podcast listener. He listens to episodes as soon as they drop. And he's like, Mark, really like the session you did on the 75 hardest schools to get into, but I think you left off MIT. And I was like, no, no, MIT was on there. Probably just missed it. Then later, I literally earlier today, I get an email from another regular listener, um, a college counselor who never misses an episode. And she's like, I really like the episode. And she sends me all these charts. She said, you just left off MIT. And I was like, oh, snap. I think that dad was right. I went back and listened, and he was. So correction, MIT, obviously one of the five hardest schools to get into, should have been on last week's episode. What are the next five hardest? I think this is pretty clear, at least from our research. And, and, not, and I'm not giving to them in order. I'm grouping them. That would be too hard to do. But the next five hardest to get into from what I've seen, would be Caltech, Columbia, Brown, Duke, and the University of Chicago. Now, one thing I want to note about that, there was 10 schools in there, and it was five Ivies and five non-Ivies. So sometimes people are obsessed with Ivies, half as many non-Ivies as Ivies in there. I also want to say this. One school in particular on that list, University of Chicago, well, yes, I'll name names, they may be in there partly by their manipulation. What do I mean by that? Well, you take less percent, less than 1% of your students in regular decision, that's going to drive your admit rate down ridiculously, which is what they do. So if you don't apply early decision or early action, you're pretty much dead on arrival. Case in point, have a student this year worked with pretty much got into every imaginable place, but not into University of Chicago and regular. And then also they are a flagrant offender of what we refer to as ED3. What does that mean? Um, 
and Julia actually has more examples than of this than I do. But we talk about it every year for Chicago. What does that mean? It means you wait list and then you go to your wait list like really, really early, April 3rd, April 7th, April 10th, way before May 1st. What does that mean? It means you really wanted to take the kid, but you didn't want to take a chance that they wouldn't come and impact your admit rate. So you reach out and put feelers to see if they're going to come. And that way you can admit people only if they're going to come and keep your admit rate down. So yeah, they have sharp elbows out here and they're not the only one. We've talked a lot about Tulane. We've talked a lot about Northeastern, talked about Case Western Reserve. There's lots of people out here with sharp elbows, but they play hardball. But no matter if that's why they're in the top 10 hardest schools to get into or not, they just are. And the last thing I'll share on this really, really hard group is I'll go a baker's dozen. From what I've seen research, there's another three schools to me that are the next three. And then after that, I'm done talking about this group. We're going to go to the 4%. And I can't differentiate between these three. To me, they're all really tough. And those this three would be the University of Pennsylvania, Northwestern, and Rice. So if you want a baker's dozen of the 13 hardest, to me, this would be that group. And I share this. I, I don't have evidence of this, but I would bet if I did that the acceptance rate for valedictorians for this group is under 35% for valedictorians. So I share that to say, if you're really going to, you know, jump in there with the big boys with that 13, like don't waste your time unless you're your um, performance in school is absolutely stupendous. Um, in most instances, you'll be expected to max out the curriculum in all of the five solids, math, English, science, social studies, foreign language, with rigor, of course, and great grades, and really, really strong personal qualities that will come through in the interview, if there is one, and in the writing and in the recommendations. And extracurriculars will usually be quite impressive, recommendations quite impressive. And and, and most of the time still need to be in an early pool if they have it to, to have a really good shot. So I just want to let you know that group is really the big boys of the big boys from my research and my experience. Um, but I'm not here to talk about that group. We talked mostly on that end last week. I want to I want to focus um, on the four percenters um, today and and let you know from my experience who they are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and just describe where they are geographically and break them down by, by public and private. And um, listen, I want to emphasize again, this is our experience over the last three years. It is based on several thousand decisions, but somebody can have a different experience. But I just I'm only sharing our experience, and so here they go. So, um, the largest group of the 35 is the Mid Atlantic, and the Mid Atlantic there are 10 private schools and two public schools, and the 10 private schools are the University of Rochester, Bucknell, Skidmore, Lafayette, Bryn Mawr Women's College, Connecticut College. Stephen Institute of Technology, Lehigh, Dickinson, Franklin and Marshall, and SUNY Binghamton is the public. And the University of Maryland is the other public school. So that was six schools in Pennsylvania, by the way. So yeah, so Pennsylvania private schools uh, dominated that group. So those are the 11 in the Mid-Atlantic. In the Midwest, uh, well, you know what? Let me let me give it to you by size of group. I'm going to jump around. So the second largest group is the West. Seven schools in the West, four public, sorry, four private and three public. Scripps College, Occidental College, Chapman University, and the University of San Diego are the privates. And the publics are UC Davis, UC Santa Cruz, and San Luis Obispo, Cal Poly. So Interesting thing about that seven, I called it the West, but literally all California, all California. So that's the next group. Now, the next largest group by area of the country is New England. And there are six schools in here. Um, interesting thing, all of them are private. 
So you've got Smith College, another women's college. You've got uh, Babson, the business school, Brandeis. So far, Massachusetts, 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 right? Emerson, another Massachusetts, and College of Holy Cross, another Massachusetts. So all five, uh, five of the six being in Massachusetts and the last being RISD, Rhode Island School of Design. So those six to me are all in that sort of 4% from our experience, our research. All right, next largest group is in the Midwest. And here we have a um, pretty strong Ohio influence here. So we have Denison, we have Oberlin, we have Kenyon, and then we have McAllister from Minnesota. And our public school here is the University of Wisconsin. And then in the, the South, which is our next biggest region with four schools, one private, I alluded to this earlier, University of Miami, Coral Gables, and then three publics, North Carolina State in Raleigh, Florida State in Tallahassee, and Clemson um, in Clemson, South Carolina. Speaking of Clemson, I leave from here to spend a week visiting South Carolina schools. That's right. I'll spend a day at College of Charleston. I'll spend another day at University of South Carolina, Columbus. And then on the 28th, I'm at Clemson. I'm very much looking forward to that. And then I'll head over to Furman, Spartanburg, and then I'll head to Wofford. And then I head to Wake Forest next in North Carolina. Um, and then I spend a week in Raleigh celebration. Our whole family's in for Joyce graduation. And Lisa and I are going to get out as well and, and uh, get a good college visit in at High Point in there. All right, so I can't neglect the last two groups, the Mountain Region, one school in here, public school, Colorado School of Mines, and the Southwest private school we've had on the podcast not too long ago, Trinity University in San Antonio. Um, so so that's the list. Uh, it was still tough doing this. There are some schools that, you know, um, speaking of Trinity, the other Trinity, that some might, um, you know, that weren't always easy to keep off the list. But there you go. Now, a few other things I want to say. There are a few schools that I think statistically should be in here, but we just haven't worked with them enough to include them. And the three that come to mind are the College of Ozarks, Hillsdale College, and Berea. Just don't have enough experience working with them. but looking at their really low admit rates, they possibly should be in here. This is not just a list of just lowest admit rates. I really want to emphasize that. If you pull up schools with the lowest admit rates, you'll see all kinds of different schools that would be on here, others that wouldn't be on here. Because schools can oftentimes manipulate their admit rates by taking so many kids in the early round and leaving less spots in the later round. They can do it by basically recruiting to reject, um, targeting kids that are not admissible, and then driving up your deny rate and driving your acceptance rate down. And they can also do it by counting a partial application that's barely even complete as a real application. So I, this is the list I gave you. There certainly would be overlap if you were to look at hardest schools to get into by admit rate, but I'm, it's not what I'm doing. I'm actually basing this on real decisions. And then the last thing I wanna say is there are certain majors or programs that are so ridiculously selective that they um, they deserve special mention, okay? Some of those are UIUC for comp sign. It's ridiculous. University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. I mean, admit rate under 5%. It might have even gone under 3%. That's how low it is. Ditto for UW, University of Washington. Just ridiculous um, how selective um, they are. And then also a program like Chapman, for their Dodge school or for film, absolutely would have to be on this list. And then also the Newhouse school at Syracuse, absolutely would have to be on this list. And then the last thing I wanna say is I, I never really included music schools. Music schools, just some ridiculously competitive music schools. And they're, I put them in this niche category, but a school like Curtis in Philadelphia, that would be on the absolute top list of the hardest of the hard to get into. Berkeley School of Music, another Boston school. So they, I put those more in this niche category and didn't include them. But there you go. There, there's your hardest 
groups of schools to get in from our experience. Hopefully you enjoyed this one as much as you did last one. Um, we're going to transition to other topics uh, next week, but I'm still going to continue on the theme of reflections from decisions from the class of 2023, at least for one more week and possibly even two. Um, we'll just see. And now this week's interview with a special guest. But now it's time for part three of my interview with Julia Shields Rutna and Jonathan Hughes, our friends from MIFA that are helping us to understand paying for college. In part three, Julia talks in part three, Julie. You see, I talked to my friend Julia a lot. I <laughs> can't get this right. Julie talks about whether a student should use home equity or a home equity line of credit to pay for college. Julie also takes on the question of whether a parent should use retirement money for pay for college. And Jonathan answers the question of how a family should allocate college savings. So let's say, for example, you have $100,000 in savings or take $10,000, doesn't matter what you have. Should you use it all at once or you should divide that over five years? And of course, we go on the lightning round and put them on the hot seat. Listen and enjoy. I want to ask you about another thing, which is home equity, tapping into home equity or HELOC, home equity line of credit or retirement plans. What are your, what's your, what's the MIFA's advice when it comes to those? Because those are other sources of money that people have. And, you know, there's people out there that say never do this and sometimes do this. And this is when you do this. And so what's uh, the MIFA advice of, of those sources of money? Because for a lot of people, those are their biggest sources of money their home equity or their retirement. Yeah, well, you know, as John was saying, you want to, when you're, when it comes time to looking at private loans, you just want to make sure you look at all of your options, right? So look at the interest rate, the repayment terms, all of that for all. And your home equity and the ability to take a home equity loan is one of those options. So for sure, um, that is something that, that, parents should look at. And for years in this in this business, I, I talked about that right up front as one of the options. Um, I think it's become a tiny bit less um, less utilized now that the uh, the tax benefit isn't there as it used to be, where if you use a home equity loan and it's not to improve your home, I, I believe, and I'm not a tax expert, but I think I think that that has changed. So for that reason, there's not not that added benefit for taking a home equity loan. Um, but then again, it just it really comes to, um, you know, can you get a fixed interest rate if you want it? What is the interest rate? Um, and so I'd say that should be looked at right along with um, with any other type of of loan. Again, you know, we are not financial advisors or experts, but but we work with a lot of them. And the consistent uh, mantra that I hear from any financial advisor to their clients is always about not touching retirement um, because um, you know you'll you'll need it in the future, and to not not touch it now that you think you'll be able to take it out and make it up, and that that you won't be able to do that. So um, that's really all I'll say about that. But clearly people should work with their own financial advisors, ask those questions. Um, but it's pretty consistent. Yeah, I, I'm always telling people there's no borrow, there's no loan program out there for retirement. Uh, but once again, I would still say if someone's sitting with 3 million in retirement versus 30,000, you know, that also could be a different situation as well. Um, so every situation I think is unique is the is the bottom line. Yeah. So I have one last question, and then I'm going to put you guys on the hot seat because that's what we do on the, on your first time on the on your College Bound Kid podcast. It's like a tradition. So, um, college savings. How do you recommend people allocate them? It's a constant question I get. You know, they'll say someone will say I have a hundred thousand in savings. Do I do 25,000, 25,000, 25,000 for years? Do I use it all up the first year? And they're, therefore, my assets look like they're a little less. And maybe I potentially can qualify for more need-based money because my assets went down. 
Uh, so how do you advise on that? Yeah, that is, I'm, I'm glad you get it because we get it a lot too. And uh, first of all, congratulations on having saved. If you have saved, we I never missed an opportunity to sort of evangelize for saving. And I always say it sounds like a platitude, but I've worked for me for, for over 20 years. And I can honestly say I've never met anyone who has regretted saving. Um, but we do get this, you know, you are able to save some money, not everything for four years, but maybe, you know, enough to pay for the balance for one year, or maybe less than one, or maybe between one and two, whatever it may be. Um, the very unsatisfying answer I'm going to give is it really depends on what makes you more comfortable. And I think it depends a little bit on the rate environment too. I guess there's two ways you can think of, um, you know, to make that decision. And I kind of think they're both splitting hairs a little bit, but one of them is the one that you mentioned, right? So uh, if you have assets in your name as a parent, that's going to go on your financial aid forms. It might affect your aid. If you spend it down, it's not going to be there next year. So you'll be eligible for more financial aid. Um, that's true as far as it goes. However, we know that the vast majority of that, that calculation, the weight in that calculation as to how much you're expected to pay goes to income and not assets. So, um, you know, it really depends on how much money you have saved. If you've got a million dollars in assets saved, that's going to, that, that will significantly impact your, your financial aid eligibility. But most people don't have that, that type of, that level there. Um, so, you know, you could do that and it may, having that money out of your assets there, uh, out of that asset calculation may uh, increase your eligibility for financial aid uh, a little bit. Um, so that's something you can think of. But but in the grand scheme of things, probably not a huge amount. Uh, the other way to think about it is, you know, what what's it going to be worth to you to leave the money in where it is if it's gaining value versus borrowing that amount and paying interest? So are you likely to gain more interest from your investment by leaving it? then you are paying interest back from a loan that you would borrow. And, you know, you think about it, if you, especially if you've got a deferred loan, you are borrowing, there's money accruing on that if it's a private loan uh, while it's in deferment. So sort of, you know, the most interest is going to come from your first loans, uh, your freshman year loan. So, um, you know, if you want to, some people like to just sort of pay what they have out of pocket so that they can forestall that borrowing and, and pay less interest. Some people like to know they have a little bit every year. It really, really depends. Um, so that is my that is my very unsatisfying answer. It, it, I do think you know it may make a bit of difference at the margins uh, how you do it, but but not a whole lot. So before we leave the topic of aid awards, money, paying for college, is there anything either one of you want to share that just we haven't had a chance to bring out through any question that's kind of on your mind? I get well. I guess I'll just say that, you know, the earlier that people start thinking about this and just learning about all of it, you know, listening to your show is a perfect example. So everyone listening today, learning about this early, so that they feel educated and you know feel feel prepared. I think makes makes a big difference because people have busy lives, and we see many people who don't get a chance to do that. And they're scrambling at the end and they and they feel overwhelmed and they just don't feel knowledgeable about the decisions they're making. Um, so I would just, yeah, encourage, hey, your listeners are doing it right now, but encourage more people to just start thinking about this. In fact, I think people put it off because it feels scary. So they just try not to think about it. But doing so, I think, can be really helpful. No, I get really excited when I when when our listeners write in and they say something like like you know my kid is five but I want to know how all this works and I and I get really excited about them making that investment to amass that knowledge at an early age and so the earlier the better. Uh, Jonathan, it sounded like you wanted to chime in with something. Well, that's you know I was also going to say to to think in a healthy way about education, right, and and really to think about not to get hung up on a, a name college or, um, you know, colleges where your friends go or where your parents want you to go, whatever it may be, but just to sort of have the clearest idea of where you want to be after graduation um, and, and follow that path. Put yourself or your child in the best position possible to succeed. 
And so part of that is going to be cost. Um, and, and so, you know, to, to think about this in a holistic way, take cost into account. I hear from parents all the time and I hear from students all the time who are really nervous about debt and about being in debt uh, and to have a good attitude. And I talk to parents all the time who are willing to stretch every dollar for that first year. And they'll say, and I'll say, okay, well, that's good. You can just barely make it for that first year. What about next year? And they'll say, well, I'll worry about that next year. But next year is going to come. Um, so think about that. Next year is going to come. Four years from now is going to come. You will be in the position of, you know, having this debt if you're borrowing or having this degree or, or following this path. Just make sure that you know um, what you want to do, have a good idea of how you want to get there. And communication is really key. Thank you. So you ready for the lightning round? Ready. All right. Let's 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 start with you, Jonathan. Uh, how do you relax? Oh, how do I relax? Oh, good question these days. Um, I am a huge movie buff. I went to uh, school at Emerson College for film. And so I watch movies all the time. Well, I did until my son took over the TV. <laughs> so I have to follow up and say, what's the best movie you've ever seen? Oh, my God. Um, I don't know if Mifa wants me to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> as long uh, as it's don't take out a private student loan, you're probably okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. My, I, I, and it's a very unlikely answer for me. Oh, my God. I can't believe I'm going to say this. But the, the movie I find myself watching more then I would think Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> well, all of our listeners know what I'm thinking right now. I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like intriguing by the name. It, yes, it's it's a, it's an old horror movie. Okay. So, yes. <laughs> all right. Same question for you, Julie. How do you relax and unwind? I guess I'm going to say one of my favorite things to do is hike. And uh, I love to be outside in all all different seasons. You know, here in New England, we get we get them all. Um, so that's what I do. I try to I try to be outside and walking, hiking as much as I can. So one someone's doing the healthy thing, and someone's <laughs> the, the couch potato over there with the nachos and the Doritos. But you know what? I can say I'm looking at Jonathan. He looks really fit, so he can he can do his movies <laughs> there. You know. That's because you can only see me up from my shoulders. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question for, for you, Julie. You can meet anybody for lunch, famous person for lunch that can't be a relative, and they, uh, they're they not alive. So somebody from yesteryear, oh. who do you, you want to spend 90 minutes with? <sighs> That's a tough one. Um, I'm going to say, hmm. See, this is harder than the interview, isn't it? I know it is. Let me just, I, wow, I know. I, I I can't believe I can't, I usually have, you know, 20 people that I would like to. Hey, I have lunch with Michelle Obama. That's, I work, I do, Um, I'm on the committee for Reach Hire. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, well, you can say Michelle Obama then. Right. And so tell, just, tell our listeners what Reach Hire is in case they don't know quickly. Yeah. Real, but. So, um, so Reach Hire, it's a, it was an initiative that she started and, um, you know, to help students go to college in greater, greater numbers. And then it, it sort of faded, but states decided that they could keep it up or not. And here in Massachusetts, we we do keep it up. And we have a, a really great group of people from lots of different areas. And we together, we come together, colleges, high schools, other counselors, to try to help those issues that, re that are continuing issues, you know, and that need some help. Um, and so we put on a conference and we have, we have meetings on, on all kinds of things. So since I, I do that work kind of on a monthly basis, um, she's, she's someone I, I think about, wouldn't that be amazing if we could get her to come? <laughs> so I have a Michelle Obama story. So I've started something with my daughters who are 26 and 24 and we started a book club. And and um, our regular listeners know I love this book for every young lady to read called Enough As She Is by Rachel Simmons. It's just a fantastic book that I think everyone should read. Um, it just really goes into 
the pressures young women are feeling today by having to be feminine, but also masculine in ways and all the things blowing their circuits and, and um, the po- problems it causes. And so we were supposed to read that because I've been nagging them forever to read that book and I couldn't get them until we did this book club idea. And then Joy, my youngest, just convinced me, dad, can we please do Becoming first? Which is Michelle Obama's book. Yeah. We'll do enough as she is, but can we do Becoming first? Because Karis wants to do it. Blah, blah, blah. So I can seed it. And so we're reading Becoming all together. Now they're like almost done the book and I probably should have read it a while ago. But anyway, so a lot of us are Michelle Obama fans. Same question for you, Jonathan. Well, I'm going to go really normie and I love Abraham Lincoln. So I'm going to say Lincoln. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Historical figure. Yep. Last question for each of you. It's your advice. Um, but I'm going to let you pick your group. It could be parents, which is our largest group, college counselors, which is a pretty big group for us, and students, which they mostly listen when their parents make them <laughs> or if they're in the car driving. But, you know, but good advice will trickle down to them. So you could pick your group and give us a tidbit of wisdom as we close. I, I, I will say I will give my advice to students okay, uh, and say it's something really basic uh, and that is when you get to college um this is I, I i think really this is like the beginning of your life your adult life the part of your life that is not going to go away um so uh to just take it seriously and and you really do get what you put into it not just your education but your friendships and your life experiences and uh, to take advantage of that and to, um, yeah, that's what I would say. Julie? You know what? I'm going to go and give advice to students too. So, you know, parents, counselors can pass it on. But I, what I'm going to say is that it's, it's, I've visited so many colleges. I have so many friends and colleagues who work in colleges and it, it really isn't about what college you go to. Every college has so many um, clubs to get involved with, experiences, you know, community service work, classes, just all kinds of opportunities. So it really is wherever you end up going, just get involved and take advantage of everything you can that's right there in front of you, you know, within, a, I don't know, a few mile radius sometimes, um, because because just... I, I I almost don't know a college that doesn't have a lot to offer. So really it's just when you get there, then push, push those boundaries and, and tr- try, try new things. And I guess don't be afraid to ask questions, a- ask, ask questions. They it doesn't make you feel look stupid. It makes you be smart. So, <laughs> well, that's music to my ears. Cause I like to close at least half of our podcast. And I know you guys are both listeners. So I, Saying it's not where you go, but it's what you do when you get there and what you do when you get out of there. And I believe that at the core of my being. And so I'm always happy to have somebody else reinforce that same message. So in closing, I'd love for you to share how folks can connect with you and what you offer. If they like what they've heard and they're interested in learning more, um, how would you direct them? Well, I'll start. And if I forget anything, John, you can you can add in. But I guess, you know, MIFA.org is our website. And on that website, you will find um, all kinds of events, which can either be in the community or more likely webinars on all kinds of topics. So mifa.org slash events. I'm going to stop you for one second. I just realized I'm picturing somebody driving, not knowing how to spell MIFA. Ah, and maybe thank you. Tell what the acronym means and then, you know, and then spell it for us. Yeah. No, that's great. M E F A. And it's Massachusetts educational financing authority. But because we serve people from, you know, all over, that's why we just, we like to go by that MIFA, M-E-F-A. Yeah. <laughs> it's the KFC so, rule. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that is, is, is the way to get started. And in fact, on the homepage of MIFA, if you scroll to the bottom, there's a way that you can join our community, which is just to give us your email and then we can send you information about you know, everything that MIFA is doing. And we target it to the age of the your child or the student so that um, it's it's time-sensitive information that will, will come to you. 
And then if it's if if it's more appealing to you, you can follow us on all the social media uh, that you that you use. And we have our podcast, um, which you know we 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 really think is a great way to get information out. And what else am I forgetting, John? What's the name of the podcast? Damifa Podcast. Damifa Podcast. <laughs> there you uh, go. We called it something else at first, but I kept forgetting the name, and we all just kept <laughs> the Mifa Podcast. <laughs> um, no, I think that's it. At Mifa Tweets, um, Facebook, Mifa underscore MA. Is that it? Or is it Mifa MA? Yep. And Instagram, Mifa underscore MA. So um, I think that's it. And once again, I, I want to put a plug in for, for all your webinars. And so when you go to mifa.org and you they have a, a webinar drop down and it's a really good way to sort of buttress n- your knowledge on all things money paying for college like I I personally use it for my own professional development I also subscribe so I get I get your notices when you're doing new ones and new things and one in particular that I really like to direct people to it seems like almost every year you guys do something on the CSS profile and that is really complicated for families um, to understand that. And so if you're applying to one of a couple hundred schools that mostly private, one schools that have a decent amount of their own institutional money, they're going to use the profile over the FAFSA because it's more accurate. Uh, but it's got over 200 questions and it's quite complicated. And it seems like almost every year you do like a profile walkthrough every year. And so that's one I personally check out every year because I always pick up like a new tidbit of knowledge. And so I'll just put a plug in for that. But thank you guys so much, Jonathan and Julie, for coming on. I've really enjoyed this. And um, I'll see you on the, on your MIFA, your MIFA podcast coming up in a few days. We look forward <laughs> thank to Thank you so much for having us. All right. Take care. Thank Bye you. now. Bye-bye. Bye. On Thursday's episode, Dave is in the saddle as my co-pilot. And we're discussing on it very interesting article called The Role of Politics in Where Students Want to Go to College. It's the results of a new study. That article is by Scott Jasek from Inside Higher Ed. We'll be taking a speak pipe question from a listener that was sent in. And I have a brand new interview that I'm not doing, but Lisa did. And it's a great one. It's with Dr. Christine Gangelhoff, an educator and a college coach who specializes in helping students interested in studying music in college. And friends, you're in for a treat. You know, Lisa finished this interview, said, Mark, this thing was great. And when I was editing it, it did not disappoint. It led led up to the hype. So it'll be part one of three. And we have a brand new college spotlight. And it's Linda Depker's first spotlight. And she does not disappoint. She's returning from a visit to Loyola University of Chicago. And it will be part one of two. Now, friends, as you make your final decision and you've already vetted your schools, you've made sure that they're an academic match for your student. You've made sure they're a social match. They're going to thrive and have a good experience. You've made sure they're an emotional match, meaning they're healthy and safe, safe emotionally. And you made sure they're a financial match. I want to ask yourself two questions. One, will I be happy here? Are these my people? Is this my place? Can this be my home away from home? But most people stop at that first question. There's a second question that's equally as important. Will this school serve as a trampoline? Will this school serve as a springboard that will catapult me or my student and prepare him, her for their future? The second test may not always be easy. In fact, it might be hard. It might involve a lot of growth pains and taking difficult classes. Yes, it's eating your broccoli. But if the school passes both of these tests, you found your match to be made and not your prize to be won. See you on Thursday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, 
that we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Motvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.